My name's David, and the chronological Bible reading for July 11th is Amos, chapters 1 through 5. Amos was a sheep herder, would have been looked down upon by high society in that time, in that day. The rich politicians and aristocrats would have wanted nothing to do with a mere sheep farmer, but God uses the humble and meek in this world to shame royalty and religious elite who believe that somehow they are better than anyone else. In the first couple of chapters, we see a progression of judgment being proclaimed against all of the neighboring territories around Israel and Judah. God calls each place by name, calls out their sins, and says, I will not relent from punishing this place. Interestingly, many of these places were used to judge Israel and Judah. God will allow wicked people to do wicked things and then suffer the consequences of their sins. We all have free choice. And it's also interesting to note that God measures out the judgment upon each individual territory or group of people based on what they should have known. He does not hold them all to the exact same standard. He doesn't expect the foreign nations to follow the Levitical law. He expects people to merely do what is right. And everybody knows what is right when it comes to how we treat other people. Our own hearts know it is wrong to deceive people. It is wrong to take what is not ours. It is wrong to harm other people. And when we do things that we know are wrong, it proves to ourselves first and foremost that we need a savior. It also shows that there's no point in comparing ourselves to other people because we are all fallen. We have all made mistakes. We have all done things that we knew were wrong. We have taken things that were not ours. We have mistreated people because of our own shortcomings, not because of theirs. And it's perfectly just for God to treat us the way we treat others. And that's why Jesus said, the same measure you use in judging other people, it shall be measured unto you. Our hearts cry out for justice. To not judge a murderer or a rapist is to neglect the victim. God does not neglect the victim. He brings judgment to the perpetrator. Either in this life or the next, without fail, everyone will give an account for the words they speak, for the actions they take, and even their own heart motivations. In chapter 2, verse 4, God shifts direction and now focuses on Judah. Now you'll remember, Judah is the remnant. It's the one tribe of Israel that sought to maintain the Levitical law, that wanted to keep worshiping God in Solomon's temple. These were the people who were supposed to be doing it right. They were the priestly nation of God representing to the rest of the world who God is. And even when the majority of Israel splintered off to chase after foreign gods, Judah remained faithful. They're being held accountable for the very thing they claimed to do, their identity as a nation was that they were people who worshipped God on his terms, not their own. And because they didn't do what they were supposed to be doing, what they had accepted as their national identity, they are facing punishment from God. Next is judgment on Israel. These are the people of God who had every claim to the history of being children of Abraham, the descendants of the original 12 tribes, these were the people of God, yet they had forsaken the kingdom of God, worshiping God as he had prescribed with Levites as priests 
in the temple that Solomon had built, living life according to their own way, because they had forsaken the instruction of Yahweh, they are not being held accountable to that. They're being judged in verse 7 for trampling on the heads of the poor. They were being disciplined for neglecting the needs of the most vulnerable people among them. He's saying, you're supposed to, at the very minimum, know how to treat people. Don't you remember the stories of how you were oppressed? You know what it's like to be neglected, to be poor, to be mistreated. And now you're doing it to your own people and those who are around you. Judah was judged for not obeying Yahweh. Israel is judged for not taking care of and even oppressing the poor and the needy. In verse 12, Israel, you made the Nazarites who had taken a vow to never touch alcohol, you made them drink alcohol. You corrupted the holy among you. You didn't allow the prophets to prophesy. And it's a lot like the church today that convinces people that under this illusion of God's grace and acceptance of all people, they don't have to set themselves apart. It's okay for you to maintain whatever identity you choose, some churches will say, because God accepts you that way. And the truth of the matter is God does accept you that way. He demands that we change. And also for the church to not allow the prophets to prophesy when people come with a heart for what God says is right and they see things that are wrong with the way that we're practicing our Christian religion today, the church oftentimes will shut them up and not allow them to speak out. They'll excommunicate them. They'll accuse them of being divisive. And so as the scripture says, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, we see it in every way. Everything that the Jewish people went through, Christians today are going through. And beware of having a heart attitude that says, how foolish these people were. Are we really any better? In chapter 3, verse 14, God says, I will punish the altars of Bethel. Bethel means house of God. I will demolish the winter house, the summer house, the houses inlaid with ivory will be destroyed, and the great houses will come to an end, declares Yahweh. Let us be careful what kind of house we are building. Many churches claim to be the house of God, but are they really? Is God there? Does he dwell in that building or does he dwell in our hearts? Friends, we must have hearts that are pure. And when we are convicted of our sin, when the Holy Spirit begins gripping us and showing us areas that we've made idols, we must repent. None of us are perfect. None of us have it all figured out. We must be humble before God and before man. May God give us the grace. We'll see you tomorrow.